Welcome to my coronavirus classroom. I'm Janessa Jacobs, and these are the Special Senses Part 2. I think I'm going to go micless today because mm, we're going to be mobile around my living room. So I kind of forgot about throwing the bone of the day into our lecture, so we're just going to wing it. And we're going to do the thoracic cage, which is made of the ribs, the sternum, those are the two new ones, and the vertebral column. So the vertebral column you have already for bone of the day, and that's what we find in the posterior aspect of the thoracic cage. So the thoracic cage is your ribs, your sternum, and your vertebral column, your thoracic vertebrae specifically. All of that makes up your thoracic cage, which protects your heart and lungs. So, okay, here's the sternum here. You need to know three parts of the sternum. The manubrium is right here. The body is right here. And the xiphoid process is right here. Okay, so when you're doing CPR, what you're feeling for is the xiphoid process of the sternum, and then you are putting your palm right here on the body of the sternum. So, okay, that's the sternum, manubrium, body, xiphoid process, all the things you need to know from that. Then you need to be able to identify ribs. Uh, you're not gonna be able to tell them apart by number, but if you were to walk up to a lab practical station and it were to say, what's this? I would hope that you would know it's a rib. I don't think you need to know the parts of your rib either. The angle or anything. But your ribs articulate on the posterior aspect of your thoracic vertebrae, and then they reach around and articulate, or do not articulate, with different stuff. So we've got 12 ribs on each side, and some of them are directly attached to the sternum via, co via costal cartilages. Some of them are attached to costal cartilages that are attached to car costal cartilages. And then some of them aren't attached to anything at all. So we actually have true ribs, false ribs, and floating ribs. Your true ribs are ribs one through seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You see here, this is the last rib that is directly attaching from its own costal cartilage to the sternum. So all of the rest we call false ribs, but then the last two we also call floating ribs. False ribs attached to the sternum via costal cartilages that are attaching to this last costal cartilage. So eight, nine, ten um, are, well, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, we can call all false ribs, sorry, yeah, false ribs. And then 11 and 12 are our floating ribs back here. And they, are, they don't attach to costal cartilages at all. These really help to give some protection to your kidneys, which are sitting back here in the posterior aspect of your abdominal cavity. So, okay, those are the ribs and the sternum. For muscle of the day, let's do sternocleidomastoid. I don't even have a slide for muscle of the day up. So I like sternocleidomastoid because I just think it's a great name. And so muscle names are based on lots of things and sternocleidomastoid gets its name for its attachment point. So our muscle of the day is sternocleido, can I see that? Yep. Sternocleidomastoid. So it's originating at your sternum and your clavicle, sternocleido, and it's inserting on the mastoid process of the temporal bone. And it's hard for people sometimes to understand how this muscle works if you think about what only one of them is doing. When one of them is contracting, it laterally rotates your head. And muscles always pull, they never push. So sometimes people are like, oh, well, what's happening? Is this sternocleidomastoid working? No, it's not. This one is, and what's happening is I'm pulling on my mastoid process. Laterally rotates head, if I'm using it on one side, and then if I'm using them both, I flex my head, okay? All right, we're gonna do our muscle meditation. Well, you don't have to go down there anymore. Got this fancy, like I respect my model shelf now. Here we go, muscle meditation. You're gonna close your eyes. And breathe in, sternocleidomastoid. And breathe out, flexes head, both sides, laterally rotates head. Breathe in, sternocleidomastoid, and breathe out, 
flexes head both sides, laterally rotates head. And breathe in, sternal phytomastoid, and breathe out, flexes head, laterally rotates head. And breathe in, sternal phytomastoid, and breathe out, flexes head, laterally rotates head. And breathe in, sternal phytomastoid, and breathe out, flexes head, laterally rotates head. And breathe in, sternal phytomastoid, and breathe out, flexes head, laterally rotates head. And breathe in, and breathe out, and come back to class. I've decided today is going to be the second hardest lecture to record from my living room because, again, there are a lot of figures that we need, but I've got models and I've got these great new posters up, so that's going to help. That's why I'm not using my mic. Okay, so for the eye, the eye is horribly important, and it's got a bunch of accessory structures that protect it. We all know what eyebrows are. They're these regions of terminal hair that we find on our face, and our eyebrows can help with facial expression, but allegedly they with from like UV radiation I don't know maybe if you're Gandalf or what's that guy in Harry Potter Professor Dumbledore maybe their eyebrows help with UV radiation mine don't really but whatever so we'll say these give you some UV protection they also collect sweat so that mind you while you're sweating and perspiring on your forehead your eyebrows will catch the sweat so it doesn't drip into your eyes so your eyebrows catch sweat. Uh, they can be used for facial expression. And that's what they do. Okay, your eyelids are these little flaps of skin on the front of your eyes that blink continuously. And what happens then while you're blinking is in these little lacrimal ducts that empty into your eyelashes, when you blink, you wash this lacrimal fluid across your eye to keep it wet. So the eyelids really help to protect the anterior surface of your eye, but as you blink them, it also helps keep your eye wet. So we'll say that we protect the anterior surface of the eye, and they blink to keep eyes moist. Okay, then if you look at eyelids, let's say those are the flaps of skin, on the back of your eyelid you have this stuff called conjunctiva, and then it wraps around and covers the anterior aspect of your eye as well. So you can look in your book and see that. Uh, conjunctiva, this is just this membrane, on the posterior aspect of your eyelids, and on the anterior aspect of your cornea. So, yeah that we would have conjunctiva on top of this and also behind the eyelids. Is that like, ooh, 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 model can show us it, actually. So if that is your eyelid, then on the posterior aspect of your eyelid, there's conjunctiva here, and then it wraps around and lines the anterior aspect of your eye as well, and then wraps around there. Awesome. <laughs> Conjunctiva, we'll just say this is a membrane protecting the anterior aspect of the eye, protecting the anterior eye. Lacrimal apparatus is awesome. I don't have a whole model of the lacrimal apparatus, but I've got the lacrimal gland right here. The lacrimal gland produces what lay people call tears. It's lacrimal fluid and it is dispersed onto the eye by, um, like, as you blink because it empties into these lacrimal ducts. Ow, oh, there goes my lens! It empties into these lacrimal ducts that uh, empty into the eyelashes. And so then the lacrimal fluid drops onto the interior surface of your eye. And where does it go from there? You can't just like not go anywhere, it actually drains into your nasal cavity. So I'm just gonna do it. There's a little hole right there. That's a lacrimal punctum. There's another one up top. So I, when I was in like fifth grade, I saw those and I'm like, what are these 
holes in my eye. That's a lacrimal punctum. So what happens is, as you blink, you wash the tears or the lacrimal fluid across your eye. It drains into those two little lacrimal puncta, and then they drain into your nasal lacrimal duct, and that is going to drain into your nasal cavity. There's probably another little name for the structure in there. And then into the nasal lacrimal duct. And then that's going to drain into your nasal cavity. So when you're crying, you actually have to blow your nose, not because you're making more snot, but because you're making more tears. And they are draining into your nasal cavity. So that's something interesting. So lacrimal apparatus. It's got the lacrimal gland that produces lacrimal fluid. That keeps the eye moist. And we'll just say drains into the nasal cavity. And that'll be good enough. Okay, and then extrinsic eye muscles are the muscles that attach to the outside of your eye. They're extrinsic or outside your eye. And when you contract them, they pull your eyes different ways. Okay? So, extrinsic eye muscles, we'll say, move your eyeball. You have intrinsic eye muscles that control your pupillary dilation. Not talking about that. Or oh, you've got muscles that control the bulging or flattening of your lens. Not talking about that. Okay, we're talking about the ones that are extrinsic to your eye. They're outside your eye, and they move your eyeball. Cool. All right, now, what about the eye? So this is the part that I thought would be hard to do without my figures, and then I realized that my models and these new posters that I have, new old posters that I have on my walls will help. So, wall of the eyeball. Let's talk about what we find in each layer, and then we'll look at each layer. So, the fibrous layer is the outermost layer, and it's got two parts, the clear window in the front, that's the cornea, and the white of your eye, that's the sclera. So the cornea is a clear window. The sclera is the white of your eye. And it gives the eye structure. On the outside. The vascular layer is the intermediate layer. And this has two parts. On the posterior aspect, it's called the choroid. And that has all the blood vessels that serve the eye. Uh, all the little capillaries serving the eye. And then in the front, it's got this region called the ciliary body, which is like a muscular region that's attached to these things called the ciliary zonules. These, this muscle is going to contract or relax, which is going to tighten or loosen these to either bulge or flatten the eye. Uh, not the eye. Bulge or flatten the lens to accommodate for closer distant vision. Okay? And then the other part of the vascular layer is the iris. This is the colored or not colored part. In the case of blue eyes, we lack melanin, so it just looks blue. But uh, this is like the colored part of your eye. Um, and this is the part that's going to be able to relax or um, that's going to be able to dilate or constrict to um, adjust the size of your pupil. So I always thought the pupil was a thing, but it's not. It's a hole. And I didn't know until I took this class as a wee little student all those years ago and did my dissection that it's a hole, but it is. So the iris around it is going to either constrict to allow in less light or dilate to allow in more light. So the iris is controlling the diameter of your pupil. The, pu the, the pupil's a hole, it's not a thing. The iris is a thing, it's a muscle that controls the diameter of that hole, okay? And then our inner layer has two parts. Uh, the inner layer is really what we, like the, the retina. And this is what is going to um, be processing all of our visual information. So it catches light and then processes it. It's got two parts, a pigmented layer that helps to trap photons so they don't scatter. 
And then the innermost layer of the eye is the neural layer. And this is where we find our photoreceptor cells. So the interesting thing about, well, we'll talk about it later. We'll just get to interesting things as they come up. Okay, so let's go look at some models or some figures uh, to see what I'm talking about. So my awesome picture even has the lacrimal apparatus. So here, let's give credit where credit is due. These things are from like the 70s and they're awesome. They were gonna throw them away at the school at which I teach and I rescued them from the trash. Thank God, because now they're coming in so handy in coronavirus classroom. So this is the lacrimal apparatus here. That's the lacrimal gland, which empties out into these little ductules that drain onto the eye. So yeah, th those are the lacrimal puncta I was trying to show you in my own disgusting eyeball. And then these lead into these little lacrimal canals that lead into the lacrimal sac that leads into the nasal lacrimal duct. Cool. Now, here we have the eyelids. So you've got conjunctiva wrapping around and protecting the interior surface of your eye. This is the sclera. This is the anterior chamber here. So you're actually producing aqueous humor as a fluid that's gonna come out down here and drain through the pupil um, and fill this anterior segment and then drain into here. So we'll talk about that in a little bit when we talk about segments. This is the posterior segment from the lens back. This is full of vitreous humor. Again, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but so as far as our layers go, our fibrous layer is this outermost layer. This is the cornea. This is the sclera. Okay, then the vascular layer, this is the choroid with all the blood vessels. And then this is the ciliary body, this muscle here that's attached to these ciliary zonules. So these are a little bit, looks like relaxed, which means the muscle's contracting. And so when they're relaxed, the lens bulges a little bit. You can see it's kind of weird. We'll talk more about it in a little bit. Uh, this is the back of the iris right here. So here is the front of the iris. Oh, sorry, that's the back of the ciliary body, which is all posterior to the iris. And then here's our iris here, which would be coming around in 360 degrees, but you can see it there and there. The pupil is the hole that's allowing light through. The lens is like the border. Well, this kind of whole region is like the border between our posterior and our anterior segments, but this is your lens, and it's going to be able to change shape to accommodate for closer distant vision. Uh, let's see what else we can see on here. Um, oh, this is showing something cool that happens at the back of the eye. Oh, we're not done with layers. Our uh, inner layer is here, and we can see the posterior segment of the eye here. The inner layer, yeah, you can't really tell. We've got two layers to that we'll look at in a minute, but um, the inner layer is going to lead away, and we'll have these axons of these cells called ganglion cells continuing away in the optic nerve. Okay, if we look here, this is showing you, if you were to look at the back of the eye from straight on, you would see this region right here. This is called the optic disc. This is also called the blind spot. Uh, you can't see here because you don't have any photoreceptors here. This is where all of the axons of those ganglion cells are coming back and exiting the eye, coming back and exiting the eye in the optic nerve. And this place right here is called the macula lutea. There's an extra high proportion of cones there, so they're really good at seeing color. Uh, other things that we're gonna need to look at, this is actually kind of a cool picture here of all of the layers. So your cornea, your sclera, your iris. So this is iris as part of um, your uh, vascular layer. You can see why it's called the vascular layer. It's got all the blood vessels in that choroid. See how cool? And then there's the inner layer the retina there, outer layer, sclera. So, um, fibrous layer, sclera, cornea, vascular layer, the ciliary body, the uh, iris, and the choroid. Okay, so our inner layer contains the retina, which is the special sense organ of vision. And the retina has two cell types, rods and cones. And if we think about it, the inner layer of the eye has two layers, an outer pigmented layer, and then the rods and cones. And 
Posterior to that, we have the choroid. The choroid, choroid means black. And so what we can see here, if I pull away all of this, the innermost layer here would have all of my rods and cones. This would be my neural layer uh, of my inner layer. And here back here would be my pigmented layer. And then outside of that, I've got my choroid, which is black. What black does is amazing. It absorbs every color of light. So people always said when I was young, I heard, black is the absence of light. It's the absence of color. No, black is the presence of it all, baby. It sucks up every photon of light coming into your eye. And so that's why it's black back there. And what this pigmented layer does is help to trap the photons so they don't scatter. And what that does is allows for the photons to hit your eye and then trigger your photoreceptor cells, the rods and cones. So we're gonna talk more about phototransduction in a little bit. Not a whole lot more. Phototransduction is a very complex topic that you can learn in great detail in some neurophysiology class someday. We're gonna go over very basics today. Uh, rods, we'll just say for right now, these are the ones that see black and white. So they, and how am I gonna remember which see which? Why did I tell you that at first? Because cones see color. So we really have like three versions of cones and they're responding to different wavelengths and the overlap of information coming onto them is what's allowing you to see the wide variety of hues that you can detect. But we really only have two photoreceptive cells Rods and cones. Rods are seeing black and white. They work in low light conditions. There are more of them in the eye. They're paying attention to like line orientation. And cones are really good for uh, color and like precise vision and paying attention to detail. So our rods, we have more of them. Uh, they pay attention to orientation. More than like detail. Maybe I'll put on my mic. Cones are seeing color and they, they're they actually at a higher proportion in the center of your eye. So when your pupil is constricted, you have more of um, your retina, just the cones exposed, so you can be paying attention to more detail or more color. Um, so our cones are seeing color. They're, they're let's say, concentrated in the center of the eye. Right at that macula lutea area, you have a high proportion of them. Um, and these have precise vision. So this is what is allowing you to see detail. All right, um, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and put on my mic. Okay, I'm not really putting it on though because I'm gonna take it off again when we get to the ear. So, okay. Structure of the eyeball. I showed you this over there on the figure. We've got the posterior segment, which I love, is full of this fluid that is so viscous you can hold it. I think it's my favorite fluid in the body because of that. It's called vitreous humor. And vitreous humor fills the posterior segment of your eye. If we were in class, what I would say to you is if you very carefully dissect your eye, you're gonna be able to scoop out and drop the vitreous humor into your hand. So instead, what I'll be saying to the assistant is, if you can do these things you've challenged your student to do all these years, you're gonna be able to pull vitreous humor out and put it in your hand. <laughs> so we'll have to do that later in the kitchen after Sunday dinner with the fam. Uh, but I digress. Posterior segment, this is everything posterior to the lens and it contains vitreous humor. The function of vitreous humor is to really be nice and thick to push the retina up against the back of the eye and to maintain the structure of the eye. So the posterior segment is posterior to the lens. We'll say it contains vitreous humor. And the function of vitreous humor is to help give shape and structure, but it also pushes the retina up against the back of the eye. One day I was on a road trip with a cousin and we decided to count all the body fluids. And <clears throat> I think I came up with 19. 
So count all the body fluids you can, and don't forget vitreous humor is the only one you can hold. Okay, anterior segment is anterior to the lens, and this contains aqueous humor. So it's this really watery substance that just fills the anterior component. And I showed you over on the figure, we're not talking anymore about it, we're just gonna say the anterior segment contains aqueous humor. And it's anterior to the lens. Oh, maybe it's anterior to the posterior segment, I don't know. All right, I do know, and it is. Okay, lens. The lens, I wish that you guys had cow eyeballs in your refrigerators right now, just like I do, so that you could dissect it and you could feel a lens. A lens is so hard, it's crazy. But like, it can like bulge and flatten. The lens is going to focus light onto your retina. So all of the structures that light is passing through to the lens really aren't doing anything to light. Now, you may say, well, then why is it if you have a cornea surgery, it helps you see better? Because that's what LASIK is. And the answer is, maybe your cornea wasn't normal. Sorry to say it, it was misshapen. And so they can reshape it, and then you can see better. But the cornea is not doing anything to light. It's just letting light pass through. You can pass through a nice, regular, normal cornea, or you can pass through one that needs some LASIK, or you can just get glasses. I don't care. Cornea is not doing anything. Lens is. Lens is focusing the light onto your retina, and it's controlling kind of, it's able to bulge or flatten depending on how far away whatever it is you're looking at is. So it's pretty cool. So if we think about the lens, it's like this structure sitting in here. And attached to it are these little ciliary zonules, also sometimes called suspensory ligaments. And they are attached to the ciliary body, which is a muscle, okay? So the muscle, it's weird, but the muscle is going to contract, and when it contracts, these relax, and then the lens bulges. Um, or when the muscle relaxes, these contract, and then the lens flattens. So the lens will say, as far as it's like a big important function, will say that it focuses light onto the retina, And what's controlling the bulging or flattening of the lens is that ciliary zonule, uh, ciliary body suspensory ligament ciliary zonule arrangement that we saw over on that other picture. And you'll look at in lab on your models with the assistant, I'm sure. So focusing for distant vision. How I remember what we do is that when we're looking for something distant, it's far, f far away, and my lens will f flatten. So my lens needs to flatten for distant vision. So I flatten for distant vision. Or I, the other thing I remember is that D and F are really close to each other in the alphabet. So I flatten for distance. So when that happens, I need to kind of pull on here. So my suspensory ligaments are going to pull on my lens to flatten it. And that happens when my ciliary muscles relax, which is weird, but that's what is happening. Everything going on the eye is going to seem upside down and backwards. Vision's just that way. That's, we're gonna do vision light, and it's still gonna be like, whoa, the eye is upside down and backwards. I contract a muscle, and it relaxes the ligament. What? Yeah, so here, uh, but not in this time, I relax the muscle, and it contracts, the ligament gets tighter? Yeah, and it flattens my <laughs> retina, and, or sorry, and it flattens my lens, and I focus the image now onto my retina back here. And the other thing about it, let's say I'm looking at this R, here's my eyeball. The other thing about the lens is because of the optics and physics, I'm not a fan of physics, I don't know if you caught that or not, it flips the image upside down and backwards. So what I get on the back of my retina is an upside down and backwards R, okay? So it focuses light onto the retina, we could say, but it also flips the image, flips and inverts the image. 
Why? <laughs> physics. You can ask a physics teacher. I don't know. It's weird. So then how is it that I perceive the world right side up? That is all a function of the occipital lobes. So let's take a quick brain break. And I'll tell you about this guy who was a scientist. <laughs> and you know, scientists want to explore everything and answer all the questions. And they want to like disprove stupid statements like your brain doesn't change. Or you only use 10% of your brain. No, you use 100% of your brain probably to 10% of its capacity. But you use all of your brain. So scientists hear stuff like that and they're, oh, they hear also things like brains don't change, there's no plasticity. So the scientist hears that and he's like, no, I can prove that brains can change. How can I prove brains can change? A really easy, I mean, if you look at the brain and how much each part of the brain is dedicated to certain stuff, vision is horribly important. So, okay, what's something that I could mess with to see if I've got brain plasticity or brain changing? Well, I could change vision. So what he did is he got these, got these lenses that flipped the world upside down so that when he was looking through these lenses, everything was upside down. And he had that for like, I don't know, half a day, but he got sick, like really nauseous because it was just too much to walk around the world all day with the world upside down. So he covered up one eye <laughs> and left one upside down goggle on and walked around seeing the world, actually seeing the world upside down because of the optics of this lens he was wearing. And after about three weeks, his brain made the adjustment and flipped the world right side up. So that even though he was looking through this lens that was physically flipping the world upside down, his brain made the adjustment to flip it right side up again. The, your brain is trying to make sense of everything. And so that is something that is super, super cool, I think. Okay, so that's your lens. It flattens for distant vision. That's the end of your brain break. So now my lens is going to bulge for close vision. Or when I'm looking at something up close, my lens has to bulge to see that. So B and C are close to each other in the alphabet. So if I have to remember that, I'll say my lens bulges for close vision. And when that happens, my suspensory ligaments are relaxing, my ciliary body is contracting, so that muscle contracts, which relaxes the ligaments, which allows for my lens to bulge, and now I can focus on something close up as opposed to something far away. All right, that's the lens. Okay, I have a quick question for you. The blank controls the amount of light passing into the eye. A, the pupil. B, the iris. C, the cornea. D, all of the above. Yeah, the answer is B. And for you, those of you out there who are like, wait a minute, the pupil controls it. No, the pupil is a hole. And how big it gets is under the control of the iris. So, yeah, let's think about that. Um, let me just mention one other thing. <laughs> because I kind of, I mentioned it in as far as the, like, the anatomy goes, but um, we haven't talked about the physiology of the iris. So uh, when we think about the amount of light coming into the eye, that is totally controlled by the diameter of the pupil, okay? And when I'm in a, fight or flight situation, I'm just gonna come back here. When I'm in a fight or flight situation, my sympathetic nervous system is in control and I need to see as much as I can. So as much as possible, I need to let in as much light information as possible. So when the sympathetic nervous system is in control, I will dilate my pupil. So I will allow in a lot of light and what that's going to do is it's going to decrease my visual acuity because I am exposing more of my rods to what's going on. So um, why am I telling you this? Because this is also part of something just important to be aware of that your lens is focusing the light onto the retina. Your iris is controlling how much light comes into the lens. So if this is my iris, when I'm in a fight or flight situation, it's going to allow for my pupil to constrict. It's going to allow for my pupil to dilate. I'm not even gonna, 
edit that one, even though I really want to. So the hole gets bigger, and this allows in more light so that I can get as much information about everything going on as possible. What this does, though, is make more of your brain pay more attention to what's going on in the rods, in the peripheries, in the periphery, which are not paying attention as much to detail. So your visual acuity goes down, so you get a decrease in your visual acuity, which is your ab ability to see detail. You're letting in less light. Now, if I'm in an emergency situation and I'm letting in less light, what might I be doing? Where might I be looking? Am I looking at things close up or far away? What might I be doing with my lens? I'm actually usually looking at things farther away so like or trying to see as much as i can so i'll flatten my lens and allow in more light to see what's going on in an emergency situation okay in a rest or digest situation in my parasympathetic nervous system situation my pupil constricts i allow in less light and so now I have increased visual acuity. So like if you're sitting around reading a book after you eat, you're going to be able to see these words really precisely. Um, and you'll be looking at something up close. I mean, again, we could like say, OK, well, if you're reading or um, looking at something close, you're probably not in an emergency situation. Then what would we want to do with our lens? Bulge, right? Bulge for close, flatten for distant. All right. Phototransduction is the process by which we transduce or change photons of light to an action potential. And oh my gosh, in the eye, is it complicated? Because you make these proteins, rhodopsin and conopsin, and then like some cells you're going to have to hyperpolarize to get an action potential. What? What? I thought we depolarized. What? Yeah, it's all upside down and backwards. So for the details of phototransduction, again, I'm going to send you to a neurophysiology class. I did not learn the details of phototransduction until I was a master's level student sitting in a neurophysiology class. So I'm not going to make you learn it today when you have all of the rest of this stuff to learn for your next test. What we're going to say about phototransduction is this is how we convert photons of light to action potentials. And how this is happening is that our rods and our cones, oh, that's the worst cone anybody ever saw, are <laughs> making these proteins that are <laughs> communicating with these other cells that are, are bipolar cells and they're communicating with these other cells that are ganglion cells, and they're the ones who are sending the information back. Hot mess. So photons of light, these guys are the rods. These guys are the cones. <laughs> photons are hitting them, and all this crazy stuff is happening. We're processing backwards through these other cells. So we're just going to leave it at that. Okay. In low light situation, your rods are act um, your rods are activated. In high light situations, your cones are activated. So once we've done this, then how is light? Well, let's first talk about how is light coming into the eye, and then we'll get to the visual pathway to the brain because light is actually going through all of these structures in the eye and then being processed a different way. So if we think about the pathway of light, it's coming in. And first, it goes through your cornea, and then it's going to hit that aqueous humor. Then it's going to go past your pupil. It's going to hit, well, sorry, it's, and hit your lens. Then it's going to hit that vitreous humor. And then it's going to go all the way through that vitreous humor. Then it's going to hit the pigmented layer of your retina first and be processed out the opposite direction. So light came in all the way this way. And now my rods and my cones are back here. So they're going to tell these other cells called bipolar cells who are going to tell these other cells called ganglion cells. And then the ganglion cells are shooting their axons back and they're going to be running in the optic nerve, okay? So visual pathway to the brain. This is the pathway of light through the eye. So that's a great kind of question for, I don't know, numbering or ordering. And visual pathway to the brain would be another great 
ordering question because it's actually starting at the posterior with our rods and our cones and then moving through here and then shooting back. Pretty cool. Okay. So, what is the visual pathway of light then to the brain? So, light is going to hit our retina and if we think about it, let's think about it. We've got left sides of our eyes and we've got right sides of our eyes. And what's interesting is that the right sides of our eyes are seeing the left visual world and the left sides of our eyes are seeing the right visual field, visual world. I don't know, this is another physics thing. Drives me batty. This that I've drawn back here is a retina. So my light is hitting my retina and now in my optic nerve that's continuing away from my eye, I have axons from ganglion cells from both sides of my retina. So let's think about this. From the retina, I'm gonna go from my rods and cones. Look in your book at this figure. My rods and my cones are talking to these other cells called bipolar cells. We said bipolar neurons were pretty rare, but we found them in the eye and in the nose. Well, here we are in the eye. Our rods and our cones are gonna to talk to bipolar cells. My bipolar cells are communicating with cells called ganglion cells. These are also bipolar neurons. But now these ganglion cells are sending their axons back in these optic nerves. So the optic nerves, we could say, contain the ganglion cells from each eye. I really wish I had more colors right now. So these contain axons of ganglion cells well, I should say from one eye. So the left optic nerve has it from that eye. The right optic nerve has it from that eye. So my optic nerve contains axons of ganglion cells from one eye. Okay? So what are these ganglion cells? They're talking to these bipolar neurons, and then they're shooting these axons back in the optic nerve. Okay? Okay. Now the weird thing, I told you that, the, that vision is all upside down and backwards, so it's important that we stick with these colors. What happens at this region called the optic chiasm is that half of my visual information crosses over, and it's the medial half. So the medial information from each eye crosses over. So what does that mean? Well, that, whoop! So right here, this little thing right here is my optic nerve. Let's say if this was anatomical position, this would be my right optic nerve. This would be my left. So let's say this is my right and my left optic nerve right here. Okay, that's the nerve. It's got information from both sides of the visual field from one eye, okay? Now, the medial information crosses over at the optic chiasm, which means this stuff here is coming over here, and this stuff here is coming over here. All right, fair enough. Well, what about all the rest of this information? It's continuing back in the optic tract with this other stuff which means that the optic tracts contain information from both eyes about half of the visual field. Optic tracts contain information from both eyes about half of the visual field. Okay, now, let me make sure you can see the bottom of this board. So, our first order neuron was this bipolar cell right here. 
Our second order neuron is this ganglion cell. And so it's synapsing in several places. <laughs> We've got lots of things that can happen because we need to be able to have visual reflexes, like immediately respond to something flying fast past our face. So in that case, I'm going to go from my optic tract to my midbrain. My hypothalamus needs to be aware of what's going on. So from there, I'll go directly to my hypothalamus. But I can also go from my optic tracts to my thalamus, to the occipital lobe. So visual processing, we said that 80% of your sensory receptors are in your eye. This little spot we just talked about today, your retina. 80%, that's huge. So it's being processed all over the place. So look in your book for the nitty gritty details of that, but know that when we're Coming back in these optic tracts, some of our neurons are synapsing in the midbrain. Some of these neurons are synapsing in the thalamus. Some of these neurons are synapsing in the hypothalamus, okay? From our thalamus then, we can extend our third order neurons back to the primary visual cortex, which is where? In the occipital lobes, right? So that's what'll happen. So you can look over the nitty gritty details of the pathway in your book. Um, but yeah, that's it for vision. I feel like it's a lot easier than it would have been in class, but it's probably complicated anyway. So take a breath, take a break, and we'll finish up with hearing. All right, welcome back from break. I don't know if we took a break, but I did. Okay. Light is focused onto the retina by A, the lens, B, the iris, C, the cornea, D, all of the above. Yeah, you're right. The answer is the lens. Great job. Okay. Structure of the ear. Ear. <laughs> Has an external, middle, and inner part. Structure of the ear. I'll show you these things and we'll write them down then we'll go look at the <laughs> picture again. So. We've got the auricle, the helix, and the lobule, which are going to lead into the external acoustic meatus. That hits the tympanic membrane here. This is the middle ear here that leads into the inner ear. I dropped my cochlea. So we'll write all these structures down and look at the models and um, the figure in a minute, but I just wanted to show you on this model. External ear. Middle ear is this really small chamber in here. And then inner ear is where you're doing your hearing and your equilibrium. So external ear, we could say we have the auricle, the helix, and the lobule. These are all gonna lead into that tube called the external acoustic meatus. And kind of the function of these things is to funnel sound waves into the external acoustic meatus. So these funnel sound into the external acoustic meatus. And that is going to be leading to your tympanic membrane or what lay people call your eardrum. So this is the tympanic membrane and also known as the eardrum. And it's kind of like the border between the external ear and the middle ear. The middle ear, if you look in at the middle ear, let's say this is the tympanic membrane there. Attached to it, we've got a bone. And then it's attached to another bone that's attached to another bone. You cannot see them from this angle in my board. They're called the auditory ossicles. I'll show you them from a cross section. They're easier to see. Uh, so the middle ear, we'll say, contains the auditory ossicles. These are the smallest bones in your body. They're called the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. The malleus is attached to your tympanic membrane. 
And when your tympanic membrane vibrates, it's going to rock the malleus, which is going to rock the incus, which is going to rock the stapes. And the stapes is knocking on this thing called an oval window. So here's actually the stapes right here. And this is the inner ear. The oval window of the inner ear is deep to that. Oh, this got broken off. Dang it. OK, where's a good one? So the inner ear contains your cochlea. Oh, here we go. The stapes. Yeah, totally got. I hope it wasn't me that knocked it off. This is the stapes. And so this is part of the middle ear. And the incus is knocking it. It is rocking. It's knocking on this thing called the oval window. The oval window is leading into this inner ear. So. Okay, malleus, incus, and stapes are the auditory ossicles. The malleus is going to vibrate with the tympanic membrane. The waves get amplified in here. The stapes is going to knock on the oval window. So what we did was converted waves in air to vibrations on this of these bones on that tympanic, um, attached to that tympanic membrane, but then also attached to this oval window, which is taking these vibrations into the fluid-filled inner ear. So the inner ear has two parts, the vestibule, which contains, if you look off of the vestibule, we have our semicircular canals. These are going to be responsible for equilibrium or head position. And the cochlea. So the cochlea, cochlea is the or contains the organ of hearing. wrapped all up in there. So those are the structures. Let's go look at them on the figures that would have been up here if I wasn't trying to avoid copyright infringement. Um, well, those figures wouldn't be. I got those, you know, from save them from the trash can. But in your book, you can look at the figures that correspond to what I'm going to show you on my wall. Okay, so this is the figure in your book that would be like your first figure looking at the anatomy of the ear. Here we can see the external ear leading into the middle ear, leading into the inner ear. So here we have the oracle, helix, and lobule leading into and funneling sound into the external acoustic meatus that rocks the tympanic membrane that is going to cause the malleus to move the incus to move the stapes, which is attached to the oval window. Now, if we look in here, there's a bony labyrinth and a membranous labyrinth. So this oval window is going to knock inside this bone. There's fluid. That fluid in this membranous labyrinth is going to rock and, and shake. And that's what's going to help us hear. Okay, and then when you move your head, we're not going to talk about equilibrium in great detail, but when you move your head, there are these little receptors in here and these semicircular canals that rotate as you move your head around in space, and that tells you about head position so that you know where your head is in space. So this is the cochlea, this is the vestibule, this is the semicircular canals, these are the semicircular canals, this is the vestibulocochlear nerve leading away. So if we look here, Gosh, I love this figure, and I'm so glad I saved it from the trash. Sound waves get amplified in the middle ear, and then when the stapes knocks on this oval window, now it's going to cause vibrations here in the cochlea. And if you spread this cochlea out, you can see that there are different lengths of hairs along the different surface, and there's different parts of the cochlea are vibrating in response to um, sound waves of different frequencies. So it's awesome. And what's really funny is that uh, as men get older, they lose the ability to hear high pitch sounds. And as women get older, they lose the ab ability to hear low pitch sounds. So as you age, like you can't hear your partner as well. So if your grandparents are always yelling at each other, it's not because they hate each other. It's because they literally cannot hear each other. 
So yeah, what's cool is that as this rocks with different frequencies um, of sound, it's going to vibrate different parts of this membranous labyrinth in the cochlea so that you can, different parts will respond to different frequencies. You'll generate an action potential there and then it will shoot back along the cochlear branch of your vestibulocochlear nerve. So we're gonna get there right now. Actually, quickly, let me show you. This is how your cochlea winds around and around. And so when you zoom in here, this is actually where hearing occurs, is in this little place right here. All right, so what is sound anyway? It's stuff vibrating through air. Like, you're gonna have to ask a physicist for a better definition than that. But if you look like in your figure in the book, it's like, here's like a sound fork with its arms up like this. And the stuff is vibrating through the air and particles are vibrating through the air. Ooh, it's rocking the air and making you hear. And that, that is all we're gonna say about sound. So stuff vibrating through the air gets transmitted to your in inner ear. How? Well, we'll say particles of stuff in space. I'm actually putting this on the internet <laughs> for other scientists to see me writing. I am, I'm doing it. Particles of stuff in space are going to form sound waves. <laughs> and our oracle, Pinna, and um, which is the Pinna, helix and lobule are going to funnel those sound waves into the external acoustic meatus. So sound waves are funneled into the external acoustic meatus, which is attached to what? It's not attached to, but what is in contact with what? The tympanic membrane. So the tympanic membrane is gonna vibrate and attached to that is our malleus, which is attached to our incus, which is attached to our stapes, which is an awesome shaped bone, attached to the oval window. So we could say that these sound waves through air are causing a vibration of bone. Ooh. What bone? Our auditory ossicles. And now that stapes is knocking on the oval window. And if we were to look in here, past here is the cochlea, right? Wrapped all around and around. Well, the membranous labyrinth is a fluid-filled structure that contains fluid <laughs> attached to different membranes. And if you look here, this is the bony labyrinth, the bones that protect the membranes. It's the same in the cochlea. We've got fluid-filled membranes in here protected by the bony labyrinth. So when our um, stapes knocks on our oval window, so here's our broken stapes. I hope it wasn't me. When it knocks on the oval window, it's gonna start creating vibrations in this fluid. And if it's, the vibrations are at a frequency that we can hear, it's gonna rock this structure in here so in here, here, your receptor for hearing in your inner ear is called the organ of corti or the spiral organ. So we'll zoom in there in a minute. Okay, so sound waves are funneled. Our stapes is gonna knock on the oval window. And in here now, we've got our membranous labyrinth that's full of fluid. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start rocking this fluid. And what you'll see is that there are two membranes. One's called the basilar membrane, and that's the one that's gonna move. And the other is the tectorial membrane, and that's the one that has our um, auditory receptive cells stuck in it. So, okay, transmission of sound to the inner ear. We've gone from sound waves in air to vibrations of bone, the waves get amplified here. This vibration of bone is gonna cause vibration of fluid, and now this fluid is gonna push on a specific part of the membrane that we'll look at in just a minute. Let me erase this. Okay, so how do we transduce these sound waves into an action potential? 
Well, we have to excite these things called inner hair cells, and they're deep in the cochlea in this organ called the organ of corti or the spiral organ. That is the special receptor for the sense of hearing, or the special sense organ for the sense of hearing. The receptor are for hearing are the receptors for hearing are these hair cells that we see right here. So these cells have these stereocilia that are sticking up into this membrane called the tectorial membrane. The tectorial membrane does not move. Look in your book at the figure that shows this. I wish my book did a, I wish my little picture here did a better job. It does not. Okay, so the tectorial membrane does not ever move. But as that oval window is rocking, it is moving that membranous labyrinth. And down here, the fluid in the scala tympani is rocking. And that's going to rock this membrane called the basilar membrane. So here in orange, I have the basilar membrane. So here in the scala tympani is my waves and fluid. So I've got waves and fluid now. What's happening? They're rocking this basilar membrane, which is attached to the vestibular cochlear nerve. And the free nerve endings there, or the nerve endings there, sorry, the, sen the receptive segments there, are ta attaching and uh, communicating with these receptive cells, the hair cells, who have these stereocilia, or hair, attached to this tectorial membrane, which doesn't move. So let's imagine this. Let's imagine that my arm is my basilar membrane. My fingers are my stereocilia anchored in the tectorial membrane which doesn't move and let's say now I'm a sound wave vibrating my oval window or my stapes is knocking on my oval window so now I've got vibrations coming through the fluid in the scala tympani and so what happens is my basilar membrane rocks and as my basilar membrane rocks these hair cells get agitated and they move and they're going to open up ion channels that cause graded potentials to flow in the cochlear branch of my vestibular cochlear nerve. That is the best way that I can explain excitation of hair cells without figures and from my living room. So, but I always do this in class. In class, I'm always like, here's my tectorial membrane, which doesn't move. And here are my stereocilia cells. And here's my basilar membrane, which does move. And here. Here's my sound. And so when I rock my basilar membrane, I agitate my hair cells. And as I agitate my hair cells, they will cause depolarizing potentials that will conduct an action potential in my vestibular cochlear nerve. So, sound transduction. I'm gonna go from a wave in air to vibrations of bone to waves in fluid to movement of the basilar membrane and that is going to we'll say move our hair cells and <sighs> causes them to um, stimulate action potentials in the cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. Which is which? Cranial nerve number eight. Is that right? <laughs> I said it because I was remembering my V's in Vegas is 10, right? So, ooh, 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 to touch and feel very eight. Yeah. For the rest of your life, I hope you all use that. So, <laughs> we'll stimulate our action potentials to be transmitted along the cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. So then from the cochlea, we, pass, we bypass the spiral ganglion where the, all those somas are, and then we can have um, processes that synapse directly in the brainstem for all of our auditory reflexes, or we can go from the brainstem to the thalamus, and then from the thalamus to the primary auditory cortex, which is where? Temporal lobes, right? 
So we can either go straight through to conduct reflexes, or we can go through to the brain stem to then go to the thalamus to then become aware of whatever it is we're hearing. Okay, sound waves are transduced to nerve signals due to vibrations on A, the tympanic membrane, B, the basilar membrane, C, the tectorial membrane, D, all of the above, or E, A and B only. Ah, the answer is A and B only. Why? The tympanic membrane vibrates in response to sound waves. The basilar membrane vibrates in response to those waves in fluid. The tectorial membrane does not move. So it sits up here and does not move. It's the basilar membrane moving that is going to excite those hair cells, okay? All right, that wraps up, uh, oh, it does not wrap up our special senses. I've got one more question. Receptors for the special senses can be found here. A, the skin, B, the head, C, the brain, D, all of the above. The answer here is the head. Great job. Now, some of you may say, well, why is not the brain? The brain is in the central nervous system. It's at the end of the pathway. The receptors for the special sense of taste are on your tongue, which is in your head. The, what are they? Taste buds. The receptors for the special sense of smell are found where? Olfactory epithelium, okay? The receptors for the special sense of hearing are what? hair cells and they're found in your cochlea. The receptors for the special sense of vision are what? Rods and cones and they're found in your eye. The receptors for special senses are all in your head. Your perception of your special and your general senses are all in your head too. But that's a discussion for another day. I hope you enjoyed class. I'll see you soon.